Him all daily. Your daily dose of inspiration. This is remote daily, an oasis of innovation for your mind, your soul. And your heart connect, act, and recharge with Remo Daily. This is Remo Daily. Thank you, Leonor and Dario, for another incredible version of the Remote Daily House song. And now the stage is all yours. I'll pass the mic over to the amazing Lisa Beasley and Susanna Schroepsdorf. Hello. Getting everybody. back to work. Getting back to work. And I'm going to open this up to questions fairly soon because I think you should all ask Lisa your work culture questions. Mm -hmm. so that she will be able to help you with almost any anything you run into or things that or share whether you want to share perhaps the reasons you left a regular workplace or changed your workplace over the last year because there are a lot of people who did that. But first, Lisa, so the Nova Collective mm -hmm. is amazing. They work with companies and it's not a short term fix. It's not too two sessions fix all of your inclusion problems in two short sessions or with a with a handout <laughs> um, these are long-term projects that nova works on and as you heard they're they're her clients and the the company's clients and their uh, staff is growing and growing because it's becoming more apparent to everybody that we need to change our work culture to be more more inclusive and a lot of people i think are looking for fairness and balance in what they do and what they're paid for and all that stuff so um i would just love to hear from you lisa what's the state of play how are people feeling about work and how are the clients that you have that are actually the bosses feeling mm -hmm. their staff so what's going on right there you know it's it's actually more of the same and i and i think us being on Zoom makes um, voices that are typically um, considered marginalized stronger um, because there's something to not having to face those daily microaggressions in person that kind of lessens the load, but also kind of makes it all that more evident when it's happening in written form and in like Zoom form. So it just makes it seem so much louder. So it's been, it's been interesting. Now, what I will say is for my company, I'm the co-founder and creative director. So thankfully, and I did this to protect myself on purpose, I'm rarely in the rooms doing the facilitations and getting the full downloads on all the audits and the culture audit and stuff like that. And one of my focuses as a business owner is like, how can I make this job different for other people? So I get to experiment with, with a lot of things like that. Hey, Maddie, can you turn that down just a little bit? And that, and that it kind of makes it difficult because it's new. And what you're doing is you're going up against a structure that's like set in stone. Like we show up to work, everybody emails, we direct reports. Like it's, you're, you're messing with that. And then you start to mess with some people's stability. So there's a lot of, even in our own organization, we have some uncomfortable moments of like, how do we accept the different ways people do things and still get the job done? And I think, that's where our work is going to, which is interesting to me, is at first, I wanna say like the first three years, it was, what's a microaggression? What's this, what's that? And now we're getting into how does white supremacist characteristics seep into how we work and how is that impacting us? How are we looking at people's lived experience versus resumes? So it's like, it's, it's never gonna stop which is good for me and my business, but it's it's always gonna keep evolving. And so seeing it, cause right now we're in year four, it feels like year 
11. <laughs> but seeing where it's evolved from just like so far has been has been really interesting. I love what Karis's meditation about get ready for change, embrace change, because I think maybe we do need Karis at the beginning of your uh, meetings with these clients, and get them ready for some change. But mm -hmm. I'd love to, if anybody has any questions for Lisa about that specific point about resistance to change or resistance to changing yourself, um, just just uh, flash your mic or or pipe in, and we'll we'll take them right now. I feel like this should be a conversation with you guys in it. You can ask anything you want about the kind of culture that you're coming from or the kind of culture that you want. Um, and to that end, you, you know, Lisa, you have one of the most interesting work life, work creative side balances I've ever seen because mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, but Lisa spent the spring um, playing different characters. We, you know, she has an incredible uh, uh, caricature of Lori Lightfoot, the mayor of um, Chicago in which she is Laura, it's just uncanny. Uh, you know, I'm looking at her right now. But um, you keep the creative vibe despite running a small company. And I think that's another thing. A lot of people picked up some stuff that they would love during the pandemic that they don't wanna let go, whether it's a human being in their house <laughs> that they got mm -hmm. to spend. I knew people who got to spend time with their partner like, oh, we're not gonna get to eat dinner like we used to. Every, you know, like we, they got used to cooking dinner with their partner or mm -hmm. whatever. A lot of that's going away. So there's the other big question is how do you keep some of the stuff from the pandemic, from the shutdown, the peace and quiet, the the time with people you love, and how do you keep that afterwards? And are you helping work like are you helping employers understand because there is a gulf between what the employers mm -hmm. want? They would like everybody to be back with their little faces in the office. Um, and what, and this has been shown in studies, I think 80% of employees want to like have a little more time work, maybe work in the office three days a week. And all the, the employers are like, no, no, we'd like to keep our eyeballs on you. So are you helping to mitigate some of those back and forths about whether office culture has to be face to face and how much of it has to be face to face to keep the collaboration? Absolutely. We, um, the, the one thing that we push back on the most or, or not even the most, but like the one thing we push back on is the idea of making it mandatory to mm -hmm. return back to the office. Um, for me, anything that's mandatory for adults, you also have to understand a little background on me. I'm a little on the, the wide end of the spectrum of don't tell me what to do ever. <laughs> so I'm a rebel at core. So anything that sounds like mandatory to me reminds me of slavery. That's just me, okay? So the the thing about making returning to the office mandatory, I don't think people understand like the disruption that could do to somebody's mental health, the disruption that could do to somebody's workload. And I truly do think it can affect the bottom line because what you're doing is you're asking people to show up and be seen performing. Yeah. And my, my whole thing was because I was a remote worker before the pandemic and it was really hard to fight for. It was, it was really hard to explain. It was, it was really hard to um, just explain myself as, as to why I needed that or why it was a thing. And I just couldn't, couldn't understand showing up to a place for everybody to individually silo themselves and work. To me, it was just, I couldn't understand it. And because 10 years before I entered into like the corporate world in terms of like running the business and having corporate clients, I did theater. So it made sense that we all had to come together to produce a certain result. But anything that wasn't people coming together physically to produce a certain result, I didn't understand the need to have to be in the office. Now, I understand the need of like camaraderie and some people are extroverts and, and need energy and stuff to feed off of. But what I also saw was a lot of adults doing adult errands during work hours. So nobody works from nine to five. It's a lot of click clackety. You get, it, it's even proven in marketing strategies, the time that people in the office get on Facebook. So it's like, you should post at 450 because that's when people are like, oh, time to get out of here and scroll. So it, I, an another one is 10 o'clock. You've been there for an hour. You're like, let me scroll. So nobody's working the whole entire time. It's also, I think, unnatural. For me, 
um, one of the biggest reasons why I discovered I'm remote is because I actually have a lot of, um, I'm still learning how to phrase it, but like some sensory things where the office lifestyle truly affects my anxiety, the bright lights, the noises, the distractions. Um, and I couldn't understand, like, it's hard for me to work on something and somebody just come and interrupt me and be like, hey, Lise, let's, let's talk about something else that, that's different from what you're doing. <laughs> so it's just like, less stuff gets done. Also, people have discovered they don't have to work as much as society has been telling us to. So to be at home in your own environment, getting all your things done in three to four hours of a day, to have to return to be in an office for eight hours. It's just like, what are we doing? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And and I'm just looking at some of the comments here and, and uh, Lisa Dukia uh, was saying that, that um, the conformity is a problem, like saying everybody should do work the same way and do the same mm -hmm. experience. Um, uh, one of the things that Google has been saying is like, oh, you need to be in the office three days a week for creative collaboration. Now, mm -hmm depends on who you are and what kind of work you do. Um, and uh, same with Deborah, who mentioned the same thing, like they they think you're not going to be creative. I don't know if it has anything to do with creativity or if it has something more to do with um, they don't believe you're working. And we've shown mm -hmm. like all these companies have made a lot more money this year. A lot of companies that were not restaurants where you need to really be there. Mm -hmm. um, their profit margins, I don't think Amazon's profit margin went down. I think that, you know, and a lot of things were shown to to be that. I think people do miss their colleagues. I don't know if y'all miss mm -hmm. people that you mm -hmm. like, but I don't know that you need to do that five days a week, right? Like that's a mm -hmm. heavy lift. Um, and on your point about people doing stuff, home stuff, Cyber Monday is a Monday when people work. <laughs> if you, day of the year, you know what people are doing. Um, and a lot of it is performative. I call it what you could do mm -hmm. for performative Slack. Mm -hmm. And have a couple great pieces in the New Yorker about how people use Slack, but they're really just showing up all the time. They have to show up in all the rooms and clickety clacks. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm to show that they're working or that they're part of the club and making the jokes. And so they, mm -hmm. the way that we perform, we have a, um, we perform our lives for social a little bit. We have a performative life on social. I think what's happening in a lot of companies, especially during the remote is performative slack. Like you're in the room, you're joking, you're funny, and you have to really think mm -hmm. about, you, know, you have to really like make an effort for this. And mm -hmm. I thought, what percentage of the slacking is actually just slack? Like, in other words, like mm -hmm. they're not actually doing stuff. And it's just yet another channel in which we, you know, are not always just straight up getting stuff done. Part of it is the the separate channels for the pets and the joking and the whatever, mm -hmm. which is wonderful for camaraderie. And I'm not dissing that. I'm just saying that for people who are just trying to do work, sometimes the, what feels like your stock in your company goes down or up depending on whether or not you show up in all these places and mm -hmm. active versus actually producing so are you seeing any ways that managers are evaluating performance differently since mm -hmm. oh absolutely um it's it's somehow converted into how are you digitally showing up mm -hmm. so when the pandemic first happened um, one of the biggest conversations we were having with people is like, well, well, they keep turning their camera off yeah. and, and we could be like, why do you need to see their face? Like, think about it. Why do, why do you need to see them? What is it about you seeing them that makes you feel okay? Also, they, we had to, um, tell some, you know, managers that how you feel about somebody turning off your camera is a you thing, it's not a them thing. Because what happens is you make up your own story in your head as to why they're turning off their camera. They could be blowing their nose. They could be um, trying to avoid their naked husband walking in the background. It could be a myriad of things. They could not be feeling it today. So that was one of the, one of the biggest inclusive practices we had to do digitally is be like, yo, camera's off, it's fine. I remember one time we did a moderated session and we encourage everybody to turn their cameras off and it went great. Um, also, we encourage people to, to start to go back to doing phone calls because something weird also happened where once we started doing Zoom, everything became a Zoom call. So it's like, yeah. yo, remember when we used to talk on the phone? <laughs> yeah. So it's, um, 
we we definitely had to put put people's radar on understanding the difference between how people show up at work. Sometimes that's a introvert extrovert thing where yeah. the person in the office that's jovial and smiling may seemingly be a better employee than the one that's straight face not knowing they could be like on the autism spectrum or there's nothing wrong with just being like I heard you yes I remember when I went to acting school um it was my first time like learning outside of my community and I was sitting next to just like the most eager people <laughs> and I could not match that energy and I, I used to get called out for being like do you care uh do I was like I'm listening this is my listening face I'm not just gonna be here like oh my god musical theater I couldn't <laughs> so it, it definitely has been a digital version of that and I'm worried about what it looks like for the majority of people to be back in the office because that's going to come back up again and people I think are more relaxed into themselves more confident in how they carry themselves and in their bodies and they've had a routine it's almost we've been in this for so long some people don't even know how they've changed so it, it could be jarring on the employee and the manager side to make it so so what we tried to do at Nova, for example, we have we have an office, and uh, but it's too small for our growth because we grew. So we notice there are some people who are like, "Yo, with Zoom, I've lost touch of humanity. I'm very depressed. I need people, and that's okay too." So we every once in a while we'll get like two Airbnbs in two different parts of the city, and if you want to have somebody to work around, show up. Um, it's not so we're experimenting with like different ways of like how do we how do we do this? Because for us, we, we've acknowledged that there are people that need the office for camaraderie, but not to literally get the work done. Um, yeah. And I, I will truly say this, when the world did start to open back up and in-person meetings popped up on my calendar without my consent, I drove to Memphis. And I was like, I wasn't, I wasn't playing. I'm not, I'm not coming. <laughs> Well, I think the technology now has to evolve for that hybrid role. I think um, John mm -hmm. said something in, uh, about um, circadian rhythms when setting assignments, human energy, like a little bit more attention mm -hmm. to things actually, how we actually work. Um, I know a lot of companies have cut down on the meetings and there's a huge body of evidence that phone calls leave you more energized than Zoom calls. Like you're, mm -hmm. working, you're, you're and you're not, thinking about what you look like or where are you sitting? Um, you know what I mean? There's a lot of, and it's just very intimate to have somebody in your ear, like you're, you're, you're talking to a group. And I think there's a lot of um, back to that. And Errol is saying that uh, a lot of people feed off each other at the office. And I find that, mm -hmm. that one of the things that I did best at, at time was being a mentor. And that mm -hmm. meant there were crying people who would stop in my office. Like I was just there, right? I was there. Mm -hmm. Somebody had to cry. There was a crying sofa in my office that was called the crying sofa. <laughs> you could come in there when your story wasn't going well or whatever and just have a respite. But not everybody was me. You know, like a lot of people were mm -hmm. not managing young writers, not managing, to Errol's point, not managing a team of young people that needed kind of me to look me in the eye and go like, and I could see it in their faces when they were falling off the, the, the ledge. Do, do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. right, we've got to find some hybrid way that's not chaos. And I don't mm -hmm. know what that is. Maybe you know what that is. Maybe people have suggested on how to run um, a um, office when you have a hybrid, because this is the question facing mm -hmm. every company and everybody everywhere. And all of you who do do freelance work or contract work, you're dealing with people in an office. So maybe you're the outside one and you're dialing in or you're whatever. Mm -hmm. How do you establish bonds and relationships with people when you're not there? What's yeah. nerve, what's a little nerve wracking is that since we've never been in this position before, we're gonna have to make it up and we're gonna have to be creative and try things we've never tried before. If you're talking about a hybrid work situation, it's like, where has that ever been a thing worldwide? Like it's, it's truly some, it makes me think about like, and this is something I, I don't know and I'm still exploring, but it makes me think about, is that gonna cause further division? 
or are people who are remote just not going to care because that's they have their lifestyle now. Um, it's like when you're not in the office, it's almost kind of like out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. And I think that's what it's going to be like for some remote people. But in terms of like the the structure of it, the structure of the workday, a lot of people really have to come to terms. And this is going to take a, a longer time for people. A lot of people have to come to terms with what does it actually take to get the actual job done? Yeah. Is it an hour long meeting to read a document you emailed? Like, is it? So it, it's going to be a, a lot of that. Like, what is the hybrid part of it? And I think it's going to be the the middle managers, managers and execs that kind of like try to set that tone of, of what those expectations are. Um, because what, like, for example, we were going to get a Slack channel, but the reason we've held off on it is because we were like, well, then that kind of makes people feel pressure that they have to be on there at a certain time. And we're not trying to do that. So we decided to use it kind of almost like a resource hub. And since we do what we do, we have like, if you're here, you're here, but this isn't the place for, did you get that email? Tell me by four o'clock, but more so like, I found this great article. I think this could have packed better than a whoop de whoop and, and trying it trying it that way. But it's, it's gonna take some inventiveness and some innovation for sure. And how do you, well, I'm just looking at Deborah. Uh, Deborah said some interesting things. She said that she's recruiting for a company that is only doing a minor change. Fridays are flexible and the rest of the week in the mm. office. So, and that mm. like Felix mentioned insecurity about not being in the office if you want to climb up, if you want to move up. Uh, mm -hmm. I noticed when I was not in the office, you don't know in these glass offices, you can see where the important people, even if you are an important person, where the other important people or where you're whatever mm -hmm. in the room with, what they're doing. But I really think it's almost creepily like social media where you see what everybody else is doing and it makes you insecure. Mm -hmm. Imagine, mm -hmm. Those two, my boss and somebody else are in the office. Yeah. What, and they look, what? They look over, they're looking over at me. They're looking over at me. Am I, am I on the outs? Am I on yeah. the Actually crazy making for me. I'm not sure if everybody, is like that, but there is a lot of the politics, you know, there's a plus and the minus, because if you're there, you can have a casual conversation and bonding with the boss, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? But you can also see other people having casual conversation and bonding with the boss and start to freak the hell out. Like, yeah, what? cause you know, you, you gotta worry about your shoes now, your yeah. pants, your outfits, yes. um, you know, office don't have filters uh zoom does <laughs> you got to worry about what your face is looking like yeah. uh how you smell it's just like a lot <laughs> yeah. well, also and, for me, it's about our our attractive like in other words like we you can't strip that out that that feeling of like am i showing too much you know men are putting a shirt and pants mm -hmm. on. Not complicated. but 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 when I mean, speaking about, of showing too much, do we have to go back to wearing bras because we're going yeah. to the office? Like that's the, <laughs> Errol said, no, please no, don't. Look at, look at Anne is losing her mind. <laughs> well, the Generation Z have given up on bras. I've had dinner been out of this apartment for the last two months. I haven't seen it <laughs> Not one. They're like, we're not doing it. We might go with a little stretchy thing where we're not doing this thing. And I'm like, God bless you. Good, good for yeah. you. Good for you. Because yeah. um, oh, the men and they're going like, what are you talking about? You have no idea. <laughs> Women come home and go, how long before I can take the bra? How long? How long? Mm -hmm. like, Lisa, it's probably I, like the this, first thing we is, do. This is, this is, am I right? That all, I do, you're in that generation. They're like, what is with this thing about bra? It's I'm great. Like, it's wonderful. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> love it. It's, um. For yeah. Go ahead, oh, for also, I was thinking about Deborah's recruiting. Nice to see you again. I remember the last time in February. Um, the the recruiting, the part that worries me is the accessibility and the true inclusivity and equity of mm -hmm. having to be in the office Monday through Thursday and what type of candidates are going to be able to do that. Yeah. So for example, I don't know what the job was, but let's say I truly had a passion for the position. I have to now consider the commute, my daughter's child care, my dog care. Um, my, I have to um, take my, my mental health into consideration. Like all of these things affect who I am as a person. I have to um, 
you know, like the money spent on food, like it's, it's more expensive to commute. So things like that, it just feels like we're going to put ourselves back in this, oh, we got all these perfect straight laced white candidates now because they were the only ones who literally could do it or had the access to do it. And that's the part that worries me about the, the, the mandatory hybrid situation of like, these are the days, come in, don't come in Friday. And then also when you build that culture of come in Monday through Thursday, it's very easy to build the culture of what does it say about you if you don't come on Friday? Um, and then you have people back in the office five days a week. And, yeah. and, the, and just if I can say the other thing is that mm -hmm. it's really prohibitive in terms of the talent pool because it's mm -hmm. New York City. This happens to be in New York City. Mm -hmm. so you can afford to live here anyway. And then you're mm -hmm. commuting in right from wherever if you're going to move here. So most people don't want to move here, you know, unless it's mm -hmm. it's hard to get people to move here. I mean, it's hard to get people to move a lot of places, but here in particular. So you lose a big pool of people and it's just mm -hmm. because there's so many other ways to do it and people just get very stuck. And as soon as they're mm -hmm. back to work, it, it's like it never happened. And I don't think that that's helpful. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's what's scary to me. That almost makes me feel like it's like a matrix like dream type situation of like, so we really just don't act like we would, we went all in the house for a whole year. <laughs> and yeah. just like, oh, the world's on back up. I went to every day I spend my diversity and inclusion money on Starbucks. And it's like the one place I go to, the one thing I do, I went and for the first time I saw people sitting at the tables and I, and I started to freak out a little bit. I was like, this is weird. Also, here's the weirdest part, y'all. And I think this is just where I need to vent. The whole idea of the world being okay with the honor system now of like, you don't have to, if you're vaxxed, you're good. And it's like, we just, <laughs> in order for Madison to go to school, I got to show proof of measles, vac all these vaccines. But now we can just go anywhere we want. And it's like, if you're vaxxed, you don't have to wear your mask. Nobody's checking, nobody cares. And that is concerning because there is still a virus out there with unvaxxed people. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, Deborah, I'm so sorry. I'm so glad you you spoke about this because are you seeing more negotiation? I know that that companies are having to pay more. You know, there are a lot of chains that are paying more per hour because they're having trouble getting employees. Mm. And are you seeing in recruiting on the higher end jobs? Are you seeing more negotiation about work days, where you live, what the deal is, or are people still? Oh my God, I need a job. Please. Hire it's, me. I think people are. Well, I do mostly like on the senior side and people are are saying are drawing a line in the sand you know like mm. i had a woman yesterday who said to me listen my current company is doing two days in the office and three days at home and she goes i would i would go to three days in the office and i'd commute but i will not do any more than that and so i said is that a non-starter because she was really interested in the job i said is that a non-starter and she said yes and when mm. i went back to the company they're like well then we can't pursue it because and this is going to be, it's only going to get harder. I think people have, like you get to a place where you're like, what's really important to me. And if I can make those choices that serve me, I'm going to make those choices and I might walk away from something. And then to me, the company just loses out. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think a lot of people, including me, <laughs> have made the choice. If you're giving me the choice between my fancy job and my life, I'm, you know, I choose my life lately. You know what I mean? And I'm not the only one. I want to like, I want to say something that I'm working on a project about burnout. And if you ever guys have any thoughts about that, because I do believe that there's a lot of burnout. A lot of people walked from their job. They left because the, because the stress, have you been seeing that anybody else, Deborah and, and, and Nanny, anybody has been seeing burnout, people walking out of good jobs because they just couldn't live like that or they wanted another choice. Mm -hmm. Burnout is real. Um, digital burnout is also real. Um, bur burning out in terms of just like, I think what I've been seeing, and I don't know if this is my generation, so I just turned 35, so I'm like on, on the older side of millennials, and I, I don't know if this is relatable, but a lot of us are just like, as a whole, what is this? What are we doing? What is life? Why are, why are we here? <laughs> and it, it makes us feel like work is another thing to do we're we're also that group of people that was um blamed for following our passions god forgive us 
um, and, and wanting to make a difference and not just make money. But that that's also another conversation because that has to do with us coming out in 2000 with the debt crisis and not having any money to do anything with. So of course you're gonna make a life of like, I don't need money because you don't have it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's a different remote day. Yeah. Oh, you froze. We lost Lisa. Mm -hmm. great, she's got a great position to be for you. Go were frozen for two sex, Lisa, and you were in a great dancer's position there for a moment. <laughs> oh. um, but yeah, I think there's the, the burnout. Of <laughs> and Errol saying about you have bonds with one of the people. Reasons people stayed at work was partially because of the friendships and the bonds and the mentorship. And that seems very mm -hmm. diffuse right now. And people are thinking about different ways to, to, to do their job, but not have their job be their whole life. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I don't know if anybody else feels that way, but I was really just not, I just realized I'd spent 20 years like donating my bone marrow. <laughs> and I was mm -hmm. like, wait a minute, I need that. I might mm -hmm. need that when I have COVID. I, mm -hmm. I have a life. Who are these people? And I realized they were my children and I would come home every day from riding the F train, which I do not recommend, or sometimes two or three trains, and get out of this, you know, the hell that it, it's just hell. And um, and as I call Brooklyn, the, the it, Brooklyn is all the commute of the suburbs with the prices of Manhattan is, you know, yeah. but get out of the train. And the first thing I do is walk in the door and yell at my kids because the house would be a mess and I'd be tired and cranky. Mm -hmm. And people forget. And I, you know, so you, there's got to be some balance between that and not seeing your colleagues and not bonding with them and not being mm -hmm. a mentor like you should be right we've got to find it yeah. what what scares me and what i hope happens um as people experiment with this hybrid world is questioning the way things were done to begin with because there are a lot of assumed um knowns are like well yeah this is how we do things it's just kind of like a baseline of work that especially people coming into the workforce it's just like for example and and i mentioned this before because it really is a thing when um when someone emails out like a presentation or something and then schedules a call for it i assume the call is going to be just to talk about it but it's to go through it and read it oh, and that was like a general and i was like that's so confusing because i just couldn't understand reading to adults on the phone and why they hadn't read it already and then it it makes me paranoid about this whole like be twice as good to get half as because i'm like have i been over preparing for things can i just start to show up not knowing anything and just <laughs> read through this with you so it's just stuff like that where it's just like where can we start to set some expectations of like hey we're sending this out take a look at it when you can hop on this call to ask questions but things like let's read to each other over the phone for people who don't need that is that's time where you could be taking a nap taking a shower make prepping your lunch stretching yeah. doing yoga meditate there's so many other things or ordering pizza <laughs> Or, or getting into a character that you play on Instagram, like for so that, so that's another thing. So my characters are pretty instantaneous. So I can't be at the office and be like, okay, let me go get into this Lori Lightfoot get up real quick. <laughs> that's just not gonna work. <laughs> you ever done a meeting as Lori Lightfoot? That's what I want to know. I haven't, but it is very tempting. It's very tempting. You just come in there and give them to go. Yep, I think we should all have other. If we're going to be on Zoom and like part of the time, I think we should all develop other characters that we bring <laughs> to the office does not get bored with our faces, right? Anna? Really right. Like, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, does anybody have any questions for Lisa? You can even ask her about your personal situation, like you know, mm -hmm. like how are you doing? How's your office doing on on inclusivity? Are you are you are your workplace or whatever you're doing? You can, Lisa's the, the mic is open for Lisa questions. Any personal conflicts you'd like her to resolve? <laughs> very good with relationship advice <laughs> yeah, she's, really good. she's really good she's got dog advice any characters she can take one look at you and tell you what character you could play in her <laughs> wow. okay yeah. what was that oh that was one one, one day we should go on a six or seven hour trip yeah yep i just went on i was on the road in the car Get this, my friends and I rode for 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 uh, from LA to Brooklyn. No fighting. <sighs> Women in a car in a Subaru. We did get 
accused of being a thruple, which we are not a lot, but I was like, I have to put that to rest just because it's a Subaru. There's no reason to judge people. <laughs> we had two small dogs, a lot of power bars and some really healthy snacks and a Subaru. There's no reason to be mean about that. And just say like, oh, you're all together. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. Uh, and and uh, I think the other thing was that, that other people live differently. I was like, look at these people. They're out jogging at five o'clock at night. They're having fun. What's going on? I don't know. I loved the St. Louis. They were all out, all students. I was half ready to enroll in, in the University of Washington. <laughs> and I was like, I'm just going to take a class. There's no, reason. There's no reason. Anything's possible. That is the other thing. I do think we we are coming out of this. I feel like the work world has cracked a little bit, but that, that, you know, as Leonard Cohen once said, that's where the light gets in mm -hmm. a little bit broken, but maybe it just means that there's enough light shining on to change things or to like mm -hmm. a, a little hum of possibility. And maybe I'm just being Pollyannish. But. No, yeah. It's going to be people like who Deborah came across where she was like, yo, two days in the office and that's it. It's, it's gonna, it's going to be a lot of that and yeah. offices, companies are going to get who they're going to get and we're going to see who thrives and who doesn't under that saying under that structure and i think the uh, to lisa's point lisa duke yeah, that the the push for child care it's in a it's in the infrastructure bill there's a child care piece i don't know if you know that mm -hmm. bill they're voting on right now and the republicans would like to take the child care piece out but uh i think what no matter what your political stripe child care is we have realized what a insanely important issue it is in the last year and how much it changes people's lives when they don't have childcare, when it's not um when it's not uh taken care of like the way it is in other countries and i'm not kidding like it's not this it is not like a hellish nightmare the way it is um here uh, and and lisa's right it'll probably get stripped out because they would like it the republicans would like it to be only bridges and roads mm -hmm. which is fine but um bridges and roads are great but um, if you can't get onto the bridge because you have no one watching your kids to go to work, then, then the bridge won't matter. Mm -hmm. so and it's so wildly expensive. I saw, um, so on my creative team at Nova, there's one who lives in Chicago. There's two Chicagoans and one person who lives in New York. And I pay the person who lives in New York more because it's more, it's so expensive out there. And I had saw a tweet where this person was like, I make $3,600 a month. Child care is twenty four hundred. You do that math, <laughs> yep. and that's what it's like. Workers couldn't get child care. You know, they had to create special mm -hmm. places for it, for essential workers during the pandemic because they couldn't have people come in their homes. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen? Is that being recognized anybody by any of your clients? Are they changing their minds or changing their ideas about? You know, you get let people work three days in the office and they save two days child care. That's a big deal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, what I see a lot of is people getting used to these little rascals just being around us all the time <laughs> is what I really see a lot of um, some people have really figured it out like I, I do know those first few months were excruciatingly difficult but some I I'm noticing some people have done the whole going back to school thing or because of the loose structure of digital working life, it's like you you find this natural rhythm of, okay, tomorrow I have a meeting at noon, so I'm gonna wear the kid out, try to put them down for a nap around 11.30. I see a lot of that. Yeah. Um, so the, as usual, these are being the flexible ones, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not Maddie, how did you PowerPoint? I think your law problems are solved. So Oof. I think, I think Felix is giving us the five minute sign, the two minute sign. I mean, we want to hear, I want to hear Ali and Dario again, but I want to thank you, Lisa. You are amazing. You are such a huge resource for us and we love you. And thank you for being funny. And because if you took all this too seriously, we'd all just be crying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. Thank, thank you, you thank so very you. much, Lisa Beasley and Susanna Shropstorff. Uh, let's all go off mute together and thank our amazing guests. Woo. You yeah. guys rock! That was great. Thank you very much. Still send yes. your personal questions to Lisa at any point about your relationships and or your children. Go ahead. She's ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just taking on the biggest questions in the world here in one hour and solving most of them. Thank you both so very much. And Lisa, we always give the last word of the session to our guests. So any final word, personal mantra, advice? 
Mike is yours. Mm -hmm. Let me go in my zone. I hope that everybody can walk in there on this authenticity. I've been doing that and it's been very mind blowingly amazing. Um, some people in mental health societies call it unmasking, which can be very scary where you just kind of like yourself. Um, and it's very jarring, but somebody had mentioned how being in a pandemic helped them shed toxic people out of your life. Did you know being yourself will also get rid of some people? Um, and it's and it's all the better. So go with that. Good. I like that. Wow. <laughs> Remote dailies, Lisa Beasley and Susanna Shropstorp. 